Welcome to our webinar, Search for Secret Flowers, hosted by the Society for Ecological Registration at The Ohio State University. We're a student organization focused on the practice of ecology and ecological restoration on campus and beyond. Today, we will be giving you a tour of our restoration site on the Olentangy River, as well as showing you how to discover hidden flowers in your very own backyard. Today, we will begin with a land acknowledgement because we're meeting in central Ohio. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their territories. Each meeting of SER at OSU begins with a land acknowledgement. Indigenous peoples have been coming to what is now the state of Ohio for thousands of years and the series of large scale earthworks still visible in central and southern Ohio bears witness to this region's historic importance as a center for economic, spiritual, artistic, and intellectual endeavor and exchange. The Ohio State Office of Diversity and Inclusion acknowledges central Ohio as the traditional homeland of the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, and other indigenous nations who have strong ties to this land. Today, individuals from a broad range of indigenous backgrounds call Columbus and Central Ohio home. Thank you for coming to our program today. And now to Dave. Hi, my name is Dave from SCR, and I'm gonna be your guide today as we search for secret flowers. You might be thinking, what's a secret flower? Well, I'll tell you, a secret flower is a plant during the spring and summer months, looks rather dull and uninteresting. But then at the end of summer and into the fall, it produces beautiful flowers that you never would have expected that it had in store for you to see. Unfortunately, since we don't see these flowers until the end of the growing season, sometimes we look at these plants in our yards, uh, we don't really think they're really contributing that much. So we pull them, we think they're weeds. Now, why is that a bad idea? First of all, Obviously, if we remove them from our yards, then our yards aren't going to look so great in the autumn. But there's an even more important reason. And this has to do with the fact that the plants that I'm going to show you today are what's called native plants. A native plant is a plant that was growing here in this area, central Ohio, wherever you may be, prior to European colonization. In most cases, these plants were growing here for thousands of years. Now, over that time, insects developed the ability to utilize these plants as a food source. They came to depend on these plants, and this is what allows the insects to thrive. Plants that have been recently introduced, which we call non-native or exotic, the insects, they haven't learned how to do it yet. They can't utilize those plants as the same kind of food source. So the native plants are really important. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know, uh, do I really want a yard full of insects? But think about insects in a broad sense. These include moths, butterflies, really beautiful and interesting creatures. And all of these insects, not just the pretty ones, they're a crucial food source for birds beautiful birds that we love to listen to and love to watch as they fly around. They really need insects. And so do other creatures because the insects are right, right down there with the native plants at the base of the food chain. So 
if you allow these secret flowers and native plants to grow in your yard, you're doing a great, a great deed. You're really helping to contribute to the biodiversity of your area. Now, where would you go to find these secret flowers, these native plants? A secret flower, that sounds like something that's growing very mysterious and uh, probably a very special place. Well, you could think of these places as special, but actually, they're pretty ordinary. Uh, the place where we happen to be today, where we're going to be showing you a variety of secret flowers, it couldn't be a more ordinary setting. We're in urban Columbus with a side street to one side of us, an alley to the other, a main street on the edge of a parking lot, and we're right by a Taco Bell. And these plants, they weren't planted by anyone except for Mother Nature. They just popped up. And that's the great thing about native plants and secret flowers. They're great at growing under a variety of conditions. All they ask is that we let them grow. And as I've explained, there's very good reason to do so. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to some of our secret flowers. The first one that we're going to take a look at is tall goldenrod. Here we have the tall goldenrod secret flower. I know what you're thinking. He must be mistaken. This plant is not tall. It'll get tall. Give it time. So tall goldenrod is one of the common goldenrods of Ohio. And these plants can be recognized right off the bat by the presence of three parallel veins that start about halfway down the leaf and continue to the end of the leaf. What about the shape of the leaf? It's a long, narrow leaf. The leaves are also, if you take a close look, arranged along the stem in an alternate manner. So this means that as you move up the stem and you encounter one leaf, the next leaf that you encounter is going to be on the other side of the plant. They alternate. The three common Ohio goldenrods are tall goldenrod, Canada goldenrod, and giant goldenrod. You would know that this is tall goldenrod, even when it's so short as a secret flower, because it has a scratchy leaf surface. So I wonder what tall goldenrod looks like when it produces a flower. Wonder no longer. It's all goldenrod. Now this is really a special plant and I'm sure you can recognize that. If this was growing in my front yard, I'd be pretty proud and I think that the neighbors would take notice and think that's a great looking plant and a great looking yard. Something that's very special about tall goldenrod and the goldenrods in general is that among the non-woody plants of Ohio, these plants are a food source for more caterpillars than any other plants. In fact, over 120 species of caterpillars use the leaves of tall goldenrod and other goldenrods as a food source. Although all insects are pretty important for birds to consume, the caterpillars hold a special place. Did you know that a bird such as the black cap chickadee, in order to raise a set of nestlings, needs to gather 6,000 caterpillars? I don't know about you, but I haven't seen 6,000 caterpillars. We need to help our chickadees and other avian friends have the caterpillars that they need to feed their babies. And one great way to do that is to encourage the goldenrods to grow in your yard. All right, so that's our first secret flower, the tall goldenrod. Let's take a look through this ordinary patch of ground and see what other secret flowers might be in store. I 
think I see one over here. Ah, indeed I do. So, big deal, right? Actually, it is pretty special. This is a plant you've probably seen in your yard. It likes to pop up everywhere. It's a secret flower known as the panicled aster. So, the panicled aster at first glance kind of looks like the tall goldenrod. It's got those long, narrow leaves. And as you can see, the leaves are arranged in an alternate fashion as you ascend the stem. But how would you know that this isn't the tall goldenrod? Even though they're both great plants, it's nice to know the individual plants you have growing in your yard. Well, if you take a look at the leaf, you'll see that it doesn't have those three distinct veins that start halfway down the leaf and progress to the end. Also, the leaf is very smooth. The tall goldenrod leaf was scratchy. The smoothness is due to the fact that the plant doesn't really have very much hair. You might think, hair on a plant? I've never heard of a hairy plant. Actually, most plants, if you look close, actually have some hair. Sometimes with this plant, there will be a little bit of scratchiness around the outer leaf edge or the outer surface of the top part of the leaf. But if you run your finger down the center, you'll feel it's quite smooth. This is especially true of the underside of the leaf. If you run your finger along that central vein, you'll notice that it is very smooth. And so is the rest of the underside of the leaf. The stem as well is very smooth. Later in the growing season, sometimes when the plant gets bigger, it'll develop very fine lines of hairs. But in general, it's a really sleek plant. The panicled aster. Boy, I wonder what this plant looks like when it develops a flower. I wouldn't be expecting much. We'll find out. Certainly are some pretty plants here. Hey, wait a second. I think some of these leaves look familiar. They do. Believe it or not, this is the panicled aster when it produces its flower. I'm shocked. I never would have expected that. So the panicled aster, when it produces flowers, is really special. Something that's really interesting about it is you'll notice that the central areas of the flowers are different colors. Some of them are bright yellow, and some of them are more of a reddish brown or a reddish orange. That's actually a secret message that the plant is sending to pollinators and it lets the pollinators know that these bright yellow central flowers are the best source of pollen. Once all of the good pollen is gone, the flower will change color. So it's a reproductive strategy of the plant that ensures that it will maximize its reproductive efficiency and it also lets the pollinators know where they can find the most nutritious pollen. Let's take a look and see if there are any other secret flowers growing here in this patch of urban ground. Sure are a lot of great looking plants. Here's a very pretty blue aster. I think I see a secret flower down here. Oh yes, indeed I do. What's this guy? This is a secret flower called white snake root. Maybe you've seen it growing in your yard. It grows in all sorts of places. How would you know that this is white snake root? Well, take a look at the leaf. The leaf has a very broad base. In fact, the base is almost as wide as the side of the leaf. Also, notice that the leaves are arranged in an opposite manner. The previous plants we were looking at had arranged the leaves arranged in an alternate manner. If the leaves are arranged in an opposite manner, that means that as you ascend the stem, leaves will pop out at the same point on opposite sides of the stem. If you look at the edges of the leaf, 
they had these teeth, also called serration. So that's some of the field marks or characteristics you would look for to know that this is white snake root, the secret flower. Well, I suppose I wouldn't mind keeping this in my yard. Rather humble looking little fellow. But is it really special? I can't imagine this plant turning into a flower. Well, in fact, it is special. Look what happens to white snake root in the fall. What a beautiful flower it develops at the top of the plant. It's a cluster of many white, sort of fuzzy looking flowers. Now, what's especially important about white snake root, and for that matter, these other late blooming native plants, is that these are a crucial food source for our migratory moths and butterflies. Wait, moths and butterflies migrate? In fact, they do. Not only birds that, might, that fly south in the winter, many moths and butterflies make thousands, a journey of thousands of miles. And that takes a lot of energy. They depend on the nectar from these fall blooming native plants in order to fuel their journey south. So that's a great reason, just another great reason, to keep these plants in your yard and to help them flourish and let them grow. Well, I hope you've enjoyed meeting some of our secret flowers hearing about the importance of native plants as a food source for insects and all manner of other wildlife. And I hope you have a lot of fun looking for these plants in your own backyard and parks and letting them grow and knowing that as you do so, you're doing a lot to help all of the creatures around us. Thanks so much to Dave coming in live from Taco Bell. So Dave's main message is that if you have these plants growing in your yard, you should let them grow. And that's because there's something called perennials, which means that they come back every year and they'll give you lots of beautiful flowers for many years to come. But another thing that you can do if you have these plants in your yard is you can help them grow by collecting their seeds and making more of them. Another strategy is that a lot of these plants right now, late in the fall, are going to be on sale at local native plant nurseries. And so you should definitely check out those sales, those end of season sales, because at the end of the season, a lot of these plants are going to be looking kind of rough. And most people won't know how magical of secret flowers they are, but you will. And so you're going to buy them and you're going to put them in your yard. Um, but if you already have them, you can collect their seeds, like I was saying. So a few rules that we like to follow um, in our Society for Ecological Restoration when we collect seeds. So first of all, we try to never take the first plant that we see, because if it's the first one you see, it could also be the last one in the area. It could be something that's not very common. And so you don't want to completely remove the, that plant in a certain area. And this is a piece of advice that we actually learned from indigenous peoples. So we try to respect that as well. Another rule we try to follow is to not damage the plant that you're selecting to collect from. So you maybe it's the second one or the third one you've seen, you know it's good to, to collect from, but maybe it looks a little bit rough and it's not very healthy. You maybe want to pass that one by because you don't want to do any damage to the plant. You want to do make sure that that perennial can come back next year and that you're not hurting it. And finally, a rule that we try to follow is to take no more than half or no more than a third of the whole amount of seeds that are on a plant. And this is a good rule to follow because even though these plants are perennials coming back from year to year, they will eventually die. And you want to make sure that you leave enough of their seeds so that they can replace themselves and they can cast those seeds in that local area and those can grow and replace the ones that die. So now that we know and we have our strategies for how to collect these seeds, we're gonna pass it to Gavin and Katie at our site 
and they're going to show us what seeds look like when they're ready to collect. Thanks, Callie, for telling us about seed collecting. So here I'm at the site, standing in a large patch of the white snake root plant. So I can tell that it's white snake root by the opposite, with the opposite round leaves with the teeth on them. And here we have some seeds that are ready to be picked. So these stand in sharp contrast to the flowers, which are still waiting to develop into seeds. Every flower eventually becomes a seed. That's why they need pollination. So to collect the seeds, we simply pluck off the white parts, which have little black seeds on the end. The white parts are called pappus, and they're minuscule hairs that help the plant float on the wind so that it can go far and colonize roadside dishes and Taco Bell. So I don't have a baggie with me today, but there's a number of ways to keep seeds over the winter. You can keep them in an envelope or a baggie or a Tupperware container. And all the instructions for this can be found on the Prairie Moon Nursery website. Great, thanks Gavin. So I'm gonna show you a few ways that you can take care of those seeds once you've collected them. So one thing that you can do is if you've collected these seeds in the fall, you can go ahead and pick a patch of dirt that maybe you've raked a little bit in your yard and you can just put the seeds down right where you hope that they'll grow next year and then rake over that area with a little bit of dried leaves to keep those seeds from blowing away and they'll just naturally get started in the spring. Um, they'll live there in the in the ground over the winter and then they'll just get started on their own. Another way you can kind of give those seeds a little bit of a leg up in the spring is to get them started now and then you can grow them up as seedlings yourself and plant them in the spring. And that could be a really fun project to do at home because you get to watch the seeds actually grow. And in order to do that, um, you're going to collect your seeds and you need to look up what kinds of requirements they have because native seeds have different ways that they like to be treated in order to grow. And one common thing is that they need basically a fake winter because in nature they experience winter. So if you've collected them and brought them into your house, you need to give them a fake winter. And so what does winter need? It needs to be cold, right? But seeds also like to stay moist. So those are the two things. This is called stratification, seed stratification. It just means keeping the seeds cold and moist. And you can just do that in your refrigerator at your house. And here are two ways you can do that. So one way that I've treated these pawpaw seeds that I collected a few weeks ago, were to just mix them with some wet potting soil and put them in this bag. And I looked up how long of a winter they need and they needed 90 days. And I learned that from going to um, the Prairie Moon Nursery website. That's a native plant nursery that's in Minnesota. And if you search for a plant on their website, it'll tell you exactly what those seeds need in order to grow. And so here's our lovely pawpaw seeds just hanging out in this moist soil in my refrigerator until December, at which point I'm going to take them out and I'm going to get them started so that they can go ahead and, and grow a little bit um, before we plant them out in the early spring. Another way that you can do stratification or fake winter is to just use a moist paper towel and put that in a bag and put it in your refrigerator. And these are actually panicle aster seeds that I collected from my yard as well that I'm going to grow. And so I'm just putting those in this plastic bag just the same way and leaving that in the refrigerator so that they can stay cold and moist. So I hope that you're finding lots of these seeds getting going in the next few weeks in your yard and you can collect them and get them started. And that should be a very fun project. And now I'd like to send it back to Gavin and Katie again so that they can give you a little tour of our habitat restoration site along the river and tell you a little bit more about our organization. 
Thanks, Callie. Thanks for telling us about seed collection. So here we're standing on the site, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the topography of the site. Topography is the study of the lay of the land. So here behind us is the upland. It's a raised area that doesn't often get flooded. Then it descends to the hill slope, and in the bottom, right next to the river, is a landform called a bottomland. Bottomlands are very rich and productive for agriculture, and also for native plants. A hill next to a river has a special name. It's called a bluff. So we're standing at the bluff at the SCR restoration site. And here below me, does anyone know what this is? Hmm. This is a groundhog hole. The groundhogs are very happy that we've been doing ecological restoration and have taken, taken hold. Just try not to stiffen their holes. <laughs> <laughs> so Gavin, what kind of birds do we see at this site on a regular basis? Birds at this site? Well, there have been a lot more birds in the last few years since we've started doing native plant restoration. Uh, my favorites are the Merlin falcons, which I can come here in the morning and see, see sparring with each other in the air. And also the bluebirds, which love, which love fields. Cool. Fun fact, bluebirds aren't blue by pigment, like, like a blueberry is. They're blue because they have tiny crystals in their feathers that turn the sunlight into blue light. Wow. So Gavin, I'm seeing a lot of these um, weird mesh things on these trees here. Yeah. What are those for? So, here at the site, we live in the middle of the city. And we're the only green space around for, well, in a mostly suburban area. So there's a lot of deer here and they're very hungry. I've counted over 20 deer here at any one point. In the fall, when the deer need to get the velvet off their antlers to sharpen them, they need to rub on trees. And we just planted these trees, so we don't want the deer killing them. So we put these tree protectors on there. They are pretty soft plastic and they just kind of annoy the deer until it goes away. How clever. I love that. Here we have a spice bush that didn't quite make it. No, what happened? Well, the deer came and he ripped off the tree protector. Oh but, my gosh. But not, not all hope is lost. Most trees have the ability to root sprout or come up from their roots after the top has been destroyed. I hope he makes it. I hope as well. Here we're walking through it. a thicket of mostly native plants, but there's still a few invasives left. Here at SCR mm -hmm. site, we've been working very hard for a few years to mostly support native plants and suppress the, native, the invasives. And which invasive is this? It's a pear tree. You can tell by the thick waxy leaves. Huh. And these are dispersed by birds. They produce a very nice flower in the spring, but after that, they can crowd out other native plants and aren't the best choice for landscaping. Well, I'm glad we're getting rid of them. I'm well. Replacing them with beautiful native plants. Oh, I think this is goldenrod. It's goldenrod. Thanks to Dave's beautiful analysis, I can now tell anywhere I am. Oh my gosh. These are one of my favorite parts of fall for sure. big tree we're walking by with the with the white bark the sycamore ohio yeah. is the most beautiful sycamores in the world that is a gorgeous tree and sycamores are native gavin sycamores are a native tree that's so awesome whoa this has got some crazy <laughs> morphology what is this all about gavin let me show you so this is this is cockleburr, oh. and well, lesser burdock is, is the true name for it. This is a plant from Eurasia that was introduced in the late 1800s, and it spreads by sticking to your clothes. Oh, wow. Um, it really wants you to plant it, but it might not be the best decision, though they do have tasty roots. Wow, what an effective strategy. Ducking through a thicket. Woo. And Gavin, what is this that we're walking through? Is this, does it have a special name? Well, 
this is the uh this is our meadow of native plants wow and it's right next to a river the Olentangy river is only a few feet away there's the river whoa so notice how we're standing up that's because when it floods the river deposits a new layer of dirt on top of the old bottomland soil I'd like to show you, it's very loose and sandy. It needs something to hold it in place. Here's a little wing stem, just taking hold. It's in the sunflower family. So it needs something to hold it in place and native plants do the job very well. Here we can see another one of our native plants very closely related to white snake root called late bone set. And it's growing roots to hold this really loose material in place until the next the next flood season. Wow. That's how we get these, they're called terraces above the river. And this is how we get land built. So and bottom land. Sounds like native plants are really important for a variety of reasons, including erosion control. Yep. Native plants are incredibly important for erosion control. And invasive plants, non-native plants, can suppress the growth of native plants under them, causing the soil to be bare. So native plants help us in a variety of ways from bolstering wildlife to even creating land for us. Wow, I'm so glad that we're working on a site here full of native plants. Me as well. So our site is right behind the, fa the Fawcett Center at The Ohio State University. Feel free to come by anytime and enjoy. Thank you so much for joining the Society for Ecological Restoration today. We really appreciate you watching our video and we hope that you enjoy looking for secret flowers in your own backyard. We wanted to leave you today with a few resources that you can use to take away from today's presentation. First of all, we wanted to provide you with today's slides and some additional photos of the secret flowers we've learned about. And if you have more secret plants that you discover in your yard, we also wanted to share a lovely guide that Dave created to common native plants in backyards of Central Ohio. You can find those at the first link listed here. The second link is Prairie Moon Nursery, the resource that I mentioned as a really good source for learning about how to collect your own native seeds and grow them into new plants. And finally, there's a link listed at the bottom that takes you to a Google map of our club's habitat restoration site, which we hope that you come and visit. The whole, the whole world is welcome. We really hope you come look for birds, look for insects, and look for beautiful secret flowers at our restoration site. Thanks again for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you.